Hey everybody, it's Anne Moline here with Women's Wellness Collaborative and today we're going to talk a little bit about parasites. I know for a lot of people this is a little bit of a creepy subject. A lot of people get kind of grossed out when I talk to them about parasites for the first time um, and the idea of having parasites. Um, I know a lot of people think of it as something that isn't so common um, in, in you know kind of our, our Western modern world, but it's actually far more common than people realize. And um, it's something that we see in a lot of our clients. Um, and so I just want to give you a little bit of background and insight into some of the common things that you may be experiencing if you if there's a potential you have a parasite infection. All right, so what is a parasite? So dictionary.com has this definition that a parasite is an organism that lives on or in an organism of another species known as the host from the body of which it obtains nutriment. So essentially that means that parasites are other critters that are feeding off of you in some way, right? So that's usually not what we want. I mean, there are a lot of organisms that we live in harmony with and that we have mutual benefit from, but parasites tend to be something that kind of eat away at your resources and really don't give anything back, right? So there's not really harmony there. Um, some of the most common parasites that we find in our clients include Blastocystis hominis, um, Giardia lamblia, Diantamoeba fragilis, <clears throat> Cryptosporidium parvum, Dolomex nana. There are some others as well, so um, I'm never really terribly surprised by what kind of odd things show up. Um, we all kind of get exposed through all sorts of, of means and ways, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Blastocystis hominis is one of the most common ones that we see with our clients um, and oftentimes it can contribute to things like Hashimoto's which is a, a primary complaint of a lot of the clients who do come to see us so that's autoimmune thyroid condition. Um, Blastocystis hominis also tends to like to pal around with a bacterial infection called H. pylori, um, which is also implicated in a lot of people with thyroid problems. So a lot of times these things are sort of underlying those conditions that you might be already aware of, but you're unaware of the way that um, these other infections may be driving that. Um, in terms of how people become infected with these parasites, um, it can be through all sorts of ways, right? Contaminated food, contaminated water, Giardia, for example, um, it's also often called beaver fever because people will get it from swimming in kind of lakes and beaver ponds and that kind of thing. Um, can't, going camping, drinking from water sources, not filtering it properly, um, traveling to other countries where there are other things, um, there are definitely some ways in which I think we are more susceptible to things that we're, to becoming infected by things that we aren't exposed to earlier in life. So um, travel can, can also do that, and especially travel if you're going to places of the world that um, are less developed. So common symptoms of parasitic infections include things that you would normally think of. If you have a GI parasite, you would think about, you know, gas and bloating, abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, right? All of those things are things that we think of as acute symptoms of parasitic infections. Um, however, they can also become more chronic and become kind of labeled as these IBS-like symptoms that are more low-grade but ongoing. And um, so often, you know, people think like that that can't be a parasitic infection because there aren't these acute symptoms, but it definitely can be something that's been lingering for a while. Um, Immune system disruption, so I already talked about the connection a little bit with um, specific organisms to certain types of autoimmunity, but other organisms also drive different types of, of autoimmunity. There are some that are particularly implicated with things like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so there are a lot of connections and research is showing more and more of these connections. Um, so if there's any sort of autoimmunity or susceptibility to that, this is definitely worth looking into. <clears throat> Um, fatigue. It, it, whenever your body is being fed upon by other creatures, um, it's going to deplete your resources and you may wind up with some fatigue. Um, these organisms also tend to disrupt and break down um, the mucosal barrier that lines the small intestine, so you can wind up with a lot of food sensitivities or inability to digest foods, um, not getting the nutrients from your foods, so you may not even feel sensitive to them, but you may be malnourished, um, even though you're eating good foods. Um, 
joint pain as a sometimes that's just a result of overall inflammation or it can be a result of autoimmune processes starting to set in that kind of thing um anxiety and depression because a lot of our neurotransmitters are created and manufactured synth synthesized in the gut so when there's gut disruption there will often be some sort of neurotransmitter disruption as well um, headaches and dizziness so again just kind of the fallout of having other organisms feeding off of you um, toxicity and cellular breakdown so most of these parasites, you know, they're toxic to our systems and they wind up producing toxins. Um, and then those toxins, some parasites even go inside of the cells through parts of their life cycle. Other ones just generate toxins that impact the cells. All of this can lead to premature cell death and breakdown of the cells that you want to have functional because that's part of what drives our vitality. So these are some of the common things that can happen. Um, in terms of testing and protocols, um, almost all parasites testing is going to be done through stool testing. Um, some stool testing, there are lots of different ways to test. There are microscopy tests that can be really helpful. Um, the one we usually run is the GI map from Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory. That is a DNA sequencing test. Um, they all have their pros and cons. I really like the GI map just because it's using really modern cutting edge technology that does DNA sequencing. Um, but it only looks for the things that it specifically is looking for. Whereas if you have somebody doing microscopy, they might, you, you actually have a technician looking through a microscope and they might see things um, that are beyond just, you know, a collection of things that they've been told to look for. So pros and cons to doing some different testing and sometimes I may even recommend doing a couple of different tests depending upon your symptoms and your history. Um, protocols. So most of the time there are some great antiparasitic herbs. Um, usually I'll use a combination of herbs and products um, and depending upon the particular parasite I may choose different ones because certain ones do have things like intracellular life cycles. So um, Cryptosporidium parvum, for example, does live out part of its life cycle inside the cells. So I might use some specific herbs in that case to try to promote um, the direction of some of the herbs into the cells because some of them can't cross the cellular membrane very well. So there are things that can facilitate that so that we can actually um, kill off the cryptosporidium while it's inside the cell rather than kind of missing it in its life cycle. So that's something that, you know, if you know what kind of parasite you have, it can alter your protocol a little bit. Um, diet's really critical because most of the time there has been damage to the gut lining as a result of having parasitic infection. So you want to be eating an anti-inflammatory diet. You want to be eating foods that you know that you digest well that don't trigger more inflammation. Um, you don't want to be feeding the parasites foods that they like, right? So that becomes a critical piece while you're doing a, a parasite protocol. Um, because as I've said several times already, there's damage that occurs to the gut lining as a result of parasitic infection, you absolutely have to do some gut healing. I usually do some things to support and soothe the gut during the protocol, and then you get more intensive afterwards, and then there would be a whole period of time, sometimes 6, 12, 24 months even, you know, of doing really targeted gut healing after having an infection, depending on how long you've had it. Um, for some of the more virulent infections, um, antibiotics are, are recommended over herbs. Um, for example, I didn't even have this one listed, but one that's called um, Entamoeba histolytica. If I see that one, which I've only seen a couple of times in clients, but if I see that show up on a test result, I will generally recommend that you do some antibiotics just because of how virulent and destructive that one is. Um, and it can can migrate outside of the GI tract where the herbs wouldn't necessarily be able to act as powerfully. Um, there are some other ones and depending on the situation, it, it may be an option. Um, if you do antibiotics, there is always the collateral damage of that in terms of the rest of the gut bacteria. So then you always wanna do repopulation and you're still gonna to need to do the lengthy gut healing process as you would even if you did herbs because that damage to the intestinal lining is still there regardless of how you go about killing off the parasite.